The Wells of Salvation is the title of our message taken from Isaiah chapter 12 and verses 1 to 6. In this life, nothing is more necessary than water so that there is no kind of scarcity that gives us more uneasiness or more distress than a scarcity of water. Thus, by a figure of speech, Calvin says, in which a part is taken for the whole, the prophet Isaiah declares that everything necessary for supporting life flows to us from the undeserved goodness of God when a man is saved. As if he had said, the salvation of God has been set before you, as if it is a constant running fountain from which you can draw waters in abundance. This was the experience of the woman at the well at Samaria. She was met by Jesus at noonday, and there the Lord gave to her the recipe to find true happiness for her life that her happiness is not built upon the things of this world, not in the five husbands that she had, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. And only when we have found the fountain of life will our life be truly satisfied. Otherwise, we will be tossing to and fro without restfulness. And the Lord wants us to find that rest. And unless the Lord would give us that rest, no other person can provide us that peace and that rest in our hearts. So here the Lord seeks for us to come to Him earnestly, to come to Him with great uh, focus so that we will not be distracted by any other thing. Because no other person, no man can provide for us that peace, that rest that we need in our hearts. I can't. You can take everything from me, but I can't give you that peace. That peace only comes from Jesus Christ. And therefore, if we would have our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we would find that peace that God wants to give to all mankind, which is so lacking in the world today. And as we seek the Lord, we find that indeed the God of salvation has been set before us as if it were a constant running fountain from which we can draw waters in abundance. This was the experience of the woman at the well. And since we are empty and destitute of everything good, Isaiah compares the mercy of God to a fountain which satisfies those who are thirsty and dry, refreshes those who are parched with heat, and revives those who are worn out with fatigue. Are you worn out with fatigue? Then come to the Lord. Only in the Lord Jesus Christ would we find the fountains of living waters. And Isaiah terms it the wells of salvation in verse 3. Behold, look with amazement and gratefulness. God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Does it sound very alien to you, these words of faith? For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation from the fountains of the Saviour. This word is more appropriate to this passage than if he had said, from the fountains of God. For it yields more consolation when we know that he is the author of our salvation, and therefore the prophet has skillfully adapted this term to the situation in which it is placed. Now, if this promise includes the whole of Christ's reign, we ought constantly to apply it to our use. Let us therefore know that 
the goodness of God is held up to us, that we may be satisfied with it. Let us come to Him like a dry and thirsty land, as the psalmist says. Stretch forth our hands, our soul thirsteth, thirsteth for Him. And that was the good part that Mary received of the Lord Jesus, for she sat at Jesus' feet. This goodness of God is wonderful. And beyond what could have been believed, that He does not suffer us to burn with unsatisfied desire, but presents a fountain from which we can draw abundantly. Are you drawing from that fountain, that fountain of Christ, in whom all benefits are imparted to us? If you are drawing from that fountain, then your life will be truly satisfied, isn't it? For out of its fullness, we all draw. It remains, therefore, that whenever we feel our want, we go directly to Him. And of His fullness have we received, and grace for grace. When we have received this redemption from the Lord, then it results in praise. As once the Israelites sang the praise of God for the mighty deliverance from Egypt, so in the future, the people of God, as one man, will again praise God for His wondrous redemption. Isaiah is speaking as though his own contemporaries would experience the redemption. Actually, he is depicting the people of the future in terms of his own contemporaries. He does this by using the singular and writing as though the entire nation was one man. The people are thus seen to be united in their praise for God. As Paul says, that ye may with one mind and with one mouth glorify God, even, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a happy prospect, isn't it? That the church of Jesus Christ would be gathered together and all of us would be looking to Him, satisfied with one mind and one mouth, glorify God. That is what the Lord has created for the church. A chaste church, that was the first prayer item that we have. Any other thing we don't want, any other thing we cannot, we cannot want because it doesn't give, satisfies us. We need that satisfaction. That is the only satisfaction that comes to us that the world cannot give us, that will truly satisfy us. And so the Lord seeks to give it to us. To praise God is to acknowledge Him as worthy and to bless Him in what He is and what He has done, and here with one voice, acknowledging the worth and greatness of the redeeming God. Well said, the commentator Edward J. Young in the days past. And so, having understood that God seeks to bless us, let us focus upon Him. Let us have our hearts truly glued to Him. When we are glued to Him, then we will find strength for life. Verse 1, when we, are, when we come to the, the Saviour, that's where we find true comfort in our lives. And in that day, thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise Thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away. Thou comfortest me. This gratitude or praise is expressed to the Lord, not because he was angry, but because he had been angry and yet turned his wrath aside from the supplicant and instead showed comfort. Yet we must not misunderstand the expression. The Bible never teaches that the wrath of God is removed and is simply turned to love. No, it's not that way. The wrath of God was not removed and turned into comfort. If that were the case, it would present a low picture of the integrity of God. Rather, God is wrathful against sin, 
and that wrath must be visited upon sin. For the soul that sinneth, it shall die. That wrath of God will fall upon the guilty one, and he will be punished if the punishment of sin is not in that particular man, but on one who in his place bears the guilt of man's sin, then man may justly show his comfort to the man upon whom his wrath had formerly rested. So God had to send his son. His son had to come and to, had to appear before us, and he had to say to us, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest upon your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. From wrath to comfort is the experience of Adam and Eve, who received the coats of skin that the Lord made to cover their guilt. You remember when they were in the garden, God put them in the garden. The garden was so beautiful. Everything was provided for them. But there was one thing the Lord said to them, don't do to partake of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they disobeyed the Lord. And the Lord said, the Lord God said, Genesis 3 verse 22, Behold, man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, a flaming sword, which turned away, turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Why was man banished from the garden of Eden? Because not only in the tree of life was there a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but not only in the Garden of Eden was there the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but there was also the tree of life. Lest he would partake of the tree of life and in his sinful state live perpetually. Imagine living in the sinful state forever and ever and ever. What a curse that will be, isn't it? But God did not want that Adam and Eve would live in that state. So the Lord came to him and prevented him. Sometimes certain things are prevented from us. Why? For our good. For our good. The earth was never the same again after the fall of man. It was cursed. And that is why Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. But the restoration came to the redeemed in Christ. For the redeemed... The curse is turned to comfort as we await the day of restoration, the day of resurrection. So salvation comes quietly as a spiritual truth in our hearts. And once that light is ignited in our heart, once the fountain is open to us, it flows, flows into everlasting comfort to our hearts. And so Paul says in Romans 8, verse 18 to 21, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. Life was hard sharing the gospel because he would face with all the incursions that men would hurl upon sinful men for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of men for the redemption of the body when Christ returns for the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope because the creature itself also Shall, have, shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. There is great joy in the believer's heart 
yet he mourned for the corruption without and within that they may be mortified. The comfort that God gives to the heart for one who comes to him truly, sincerely, and that you cannot fake, isn't it? If you truly have it, you have it. God gives it to you. You have that peace and you are happy and that peace will overflow to the people around us, isn't it? The regathering of Israel in the Promised Land the second time, as we saw in the last chapter, in chapter 11, attested to the veracity of God's Word, a step nearer to the redemption that comes when Christ returns to restore the cursed earth into her former Edenic state. So, since Adam was banished from the Garden of Eden, the world never recovered. Men never recovered. That was the thought at the close of chapter 11. But his promise was to restore them to the land again. Israel will come back to the land again after their dispersal in the diaspora. It is the diaspora for more than 1,900 years that was fulfilled, that has fulfilled what Isaiah gave in prophecy and points to the nearest, nearness of the coming restoration when Christ returns. So, Israel must be back in the land before Christ would rule from Israel. Righteousness will fill the earth and with ensuing peace because Christ, the righteous ruler, presides over the earth. And this begins with Israel's return to the land, albeit in their sinful state. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set His hand again the second time to recover the remnant of His people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pethros and from Cush, from Elam, from Shina and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea, he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The historical setting of the prophecy is of the greatest importance. Why did Isaiah speak like that? The prophecies and shrine. Uh, as our driver said well, the prophecies enshrine indeed moral and spiritual truths, the value of which is quite independent of their historical setting. They exhibit ideals of conduct and belief which are valid for all time. They insist with an earnestness and eloquence which can never lose their spell upon the great principles of man's duty towards God and his neighbour, which remain the same in whatever society he is placed. But the prophets were more than the teachers of an abstract religion or morality. Almost everything that they wrote had some reference to the age in which they lived. What happened during the time of Isaiah? Israel departed from God. The people of God departed from him. They call good evil and evil good. The religious, moral and social needs of the people among whom they moved, their relation to foreign nations or contemporary circumstances and events, they took a keen interest in affairs of national importance. They came forward as statesmen and advisers to the king and people upon critical occasions of the national history. If we have the Word of God, then the Word of God will guide us, isn't it? As a lamb to our feet and a light to our path, the Word of God helps us to interpret and understand the behaviours of men in our time from a biblical perspective, God's perspective, which matters ultimately, especially in this last of the last days. When Israel is back in the land, 
the prophetic, the prophetic word given 2,600 years ago, 700 BC, Isaiah spoke, had been fulfilled in our generation, just within our generation, not in any other generation. Christ's return, therefore, dear friends, is imminent. The restoration is coming, and He shall set up an ensign for the nations. The word ensign means a flag, a banner, more so a standard. Israel coming together as a nation. The resurrection of the nation from the death kill of the Romans in AD 70. Their dispersal and the regathering is a divine message to the nations of the existence of the God of Israel. The flag signifies that it is indeed a nation amongst all the nations of the world. Every nation has a flag, isn't it? When they become a nation, uh, they, they will make for themselves a flag. Just as when the church is established, right, the church has its own logo. Right? We have our own logo. Now, how did it come about? Well, the Lord provided for us as an emblem of the mission that God gives to us. The flag signifies that it is indeed a nation among all the nations of the world. It brings forth more than the national existence of a nation to view, but its language and culture resurrected with the reinstatement of the Hebrew Bible as the source of its origin and is the backbone of modern Hebrew language and culture. So how did Israel come together and be able, the people able to communicate among themselves? Well, they went back to the to the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. And there, they were able to resurrect the Hebrew language, the same words which are there. And the culture, a biblical culture, more than that, it is the reinstating of God's laws as a reflection of His veracity throughout human history. And their own history attested to it. If they would follow the Lord, they would do well. Isn't it? And this is an example that we have today of Israel going after the people in, in, in Gaza, isn't it? That they would have to do so according to the laws of God to protect the sanctity of human lives and do so legitimately. Then God's protection would be upon them. But if they do so, in their own way, then God's protection would be removed from them. Deuteronomy 4, verse 5 to 10. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord thy, my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes, and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon Him for? And what nation is there so great, that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thy eyes have seen, lest they depart from thy day, thy heart, all the days of thy life. But teach them unto thy son's son, especially the day when thou standest before the Lord thy God in Horeb. When the Lord said unto me, Gather the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may hear me and fear me all the days of thy life, that they shall live upon the earth, that they may teach their children. Of course, when these words were given by Moses to the new generation that arose at the, when the brink of entering the promised land, the Lord was about to renew the covenant with them that was broken. Why was the, the covenant broken? Because of their unbelief. That generation never entered the promised land. The Lord wanted them to do so. But they did not because they have not come to God in faith. 
with the skins of the flesh, it doesn't help at all. Israel's failures reinforces the truth of God's word. The blessing of obedience and the cursings of disobedience. At this juncture, we see the events leading to their destruction by the Assyrians and later by the Babylonians. So, 700 BC, 722, the Assyrians would come and Israel, the northern ten tribes, would be taken out forever. And later on, 586 BC, the final straw, where the Lord sent the Babylonians to come and Israel was taken out of the land. It proves the truth of God's good word, the blessings of keeping His precepts. Despite Israel's waywardness, God did not forsake them. He chastises them so that He may restore them. God does not forsake His people. There has always been a remnant in Israel who loves the Lord and are obedient to His commandments. Even when the nation was rejected, God raised a group of 12, 12 apostles. Of course, Judas was taken out. Right? The Lord took him out. But the rest of them, the Lord would use to begin the infant church. Whenever God's laws are upheld, there is righteousness and God's blessing. We can see this throughout human history with the gospel reaching the heart of the Roman Empire. We say that the entire Roman Empire was Christianized, isn't it? But decline came when men took over and displaced God, giving rise to the Dark Ages from 500 AD to 1500 AD, before the Renaissance and then the 16th century, Protestant Reformation in Europe, when the gospel light was lit up once again. When persecution came to Europe, the gospel torch was lit in America in the past 200 years. Today, persecution has come to the Christians in America, especially the past three years, with the constitution attacked so that it can be suspended bringing tyranny to the land. There are now approximately 100 million Christians in China, underground churches, estimated. Has it exceeded the Christians in America? Is God going to give them to hold the gospel torch in the last leg across the Middle East back to Jerusalem? The world is tittering in this unstable state, groaning, in sin. The Jews are back in the land. The persecution of the Jews is a picture of the battle for the fulfillment of prophecy, to set the stage for Christ's return. Israel must be in the land again. And Christ's rule will be physical, right? just as Nebuchadnezzar ruled. Christ will rule and this will be physical, and he will do so from Jerusalem. Today, the Jewish people not only remember as a historical event the first Passover, but also celebrate in a larger sense their freedom as Jews, having come together as a nation. The first Passover, according to the biblical timeline, occurred on the 4th of May, 1451 B.C. Israel was re-established as a nation on the 14th of May, 1948. It is now 75 years that Israel is back in the land. Why is Israel back in the land? It is in preparation for Christ's rule upon earth in the millennium. For, to be for this to be fulfilled, there must be a nation of Israel and their capital Jerusalem. On the 6th of December 2017, Jerusalem was formally recognized as the capital of Israel and stated that the American embassy would be moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. These events must come to pass 
to bring forth the fulfilling of prophecy. When Christ returns, He will rule from Israel. As we saw in the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 11, the scene leading to the establishment of Christ's rule, Revelation 16 to 19, in the millennium where the Edenic state will be restored, Revelation 20 verse 1 to, to 6, the Lord wants us to see that the earth has to be restored to its Edenic state. If it is not restored, then there is no, no, no peace, isn't it? You look at the world today, we thought that there would be peace after 40, 50 years of, well, pseudo-peace that we say that, that is in the world. Isaiah 11, 4 to 9 gives to us what God would do, what Christ would do for the earth. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall smite the earth with the rod, with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopards shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion and the fatlings together, and the young child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed Right, the bear, right, the bear, we recently we read about the bear, how the bear is so ferocious, isn't it? Right, and it, it harms uh, all that gets in its way. Well, there will come a time when the cow and the bear shall feed their young, one shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the wind child shall put his hand on the cockatrice, then they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So at that time, if the nations rebel, there will be no rain, so no crop. Christ's rule is very clear, very practical, isn't it? The nations will come to Jerusalem to worship the Lord Jesus. He will reign on earth as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There will be true righteousness on the earth. So Daniel wrote when he gave the vision to Nebuchadnezzar concerning this kingdom. And in the days of these kingdoms shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall, of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever for as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter and the dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. And then the Lord gave a second instalment to Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, verses 24 to 25. And then the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse of the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the great the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High to think to change the times and the laws, and they shall be given into His hand until the time and times and the dividing of times. The laws that God gives, the universal laws that would keep human civilization in order. Right? This morning we were studying those laws needed for servants, Six years they would work, seventh year is the release. How they would uh, treat servants. Uh, God's laws shows us the way. And there you see, when we have the laws of God, they guide us, isn't it? But when you have the tyrant coming to rule, 
he would change the law. So the central bank digital currency. When it comes, well, <laughs> you don't need currency anymore and you cannot buy and sell unless you are hooked into the system. There's no other way out. Today, you go to certain parts of the world, uh, you can't transact. You can't transact. You, you give money, you can't. You can't buy anything. They won't accept from you. A day will come when the system arises and we see that, well, it is in our doorstep. But the judgment shall sit and they shall turn away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. God's kingdom that will finally rule upon earth, and we look forward to that time, isn't it? That there would no longer be incursions and you know that the heart would be subdued, the Spirit of God will take hold and the saints would not have to wrestle with the sin problem, right? the nature of the, the corrupt flesh that is in us. And when we are in the state of the resurrection, when Christ would return, then all those would be taken away. But for now, for now, if you have the Lord with you and the Spirit of God in you, then if the power that God gives to you to subdue the flesh, and how, and this is the praise of the people of God. That's our second thought, faith. Faith. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. As the remnant in Israel saw the impending war arising in their land, the looming invasion, the Syrian invasion, and then the Babylonian invasion, the people of God are jotted to see the salvation that is in Christ, Israel's Messiah. The exhortation is to have faith to follow Him, though there was a great falling away in Israel. It is the same in our age, isn't it? As you look around us in the churches today, there is a great falling away. Plagued with apostasy, the falling away of the church, the ecumenical movement taking shape, uniting the religions of the world under Rome, the church is exhorted to trust God and to remain true to His Word. There were, during the times of the Roman rule, where the Roman rulers, they built the, the place whereby all the gods of the lands in which they conquered could be placed under one roof. And they all will worship the Lord Caesar. But there was only one amongst them that will not call Caesar Lord, but Christ Lord. And they were sorely persecuted. And this group are the Christians. And you would see this and acting itself again in these last days. If you would declare and believe that only Jesus saves, that He is the living and true God, the only God, then you will realize that you will be very, very much a minority and ostracized and not allowed. Would you still follow the Lord? Well, the disciples who were with Jesus thought about it and they came to the conclusion 
To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. Rima. The words in which God gave life to us, eternal life to us. The words that, that were given that caused the fishes to swim into Peter's net. The words that were given by the Lord Jesus Christ that dispelled Satan's attacks. Christ and his words, to whom shall we go? Dear friends, there's no other way. If we have understood this, you realize that there is no other refuge you can seek. But to seek this Christ, you find yourself sorely persecuted. That is why the psalmist, or that's why Isaiah would say, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust. I will trust. The word trust we mentioned right, is to lie prostrate, to, 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 to have like, totally no energy, no strength anymore, totally given over to the Lord. For when we truly trust Him, then we will not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah and His strength will be our strength and our song. He's become our salvation. As the remnant in Israel saw the impending war arising in their land, the looming Assyrian invasion, then the Babylonians, they, they are all jotted. They saw the danger. But you see that the Lord is still on the throne. And there, we realize that we would continue our onward march. The cause for joy and rejoicing and singing, the songs for victory, the triumphs in Christ, the only hope for the world. The people of God are exhorted to keep faith and let faith prevail and press on with the gospel work. We are much encouraged with someone coming to church because she received a gospel invitation from our tracting team. She's not a believer, and we thank God we had the opportunity to share the gospel with her. We pray that she will come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way, only when God would convert and change a heart, change a soul, there is hope. Pseudo change, no hope. Only when the Lord would truly change, we would come to Him fully surrendered. We rejoice as the angels in heaven rejoice with us at every blessing of being part of the gospel work on earth. We are told to behold, God is our salvation. Look to Christ and the things of earth will go strangely dim. Now the brightness of the Lord God's Reconciled face would shine forth. Behold, the long-awaited deliverance has arrived. My salvation is God Himself. Now the great truth is clearly stated. How wondrous had the preparation been for its announcement. With us is God. El is my salvation. A remnant will return unto mighty God. Blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord. Happy the one who can say, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Will you trust and not be afraid? If God is once our salvation, then there is a need only to trust, no need for fear. So the psalmist says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Those and host should encamp against me. My heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle will he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now my 
Now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. What is meant when the Lord says, God is my salvation? It means that he is the author, the cause, the agent, the accomplisher of that salvation. Salvation apart from God is unthinkable. In the, eternal, in the counsels of eternity, God the Father ordained unto life and salvation His people. In time, God the Son wrought that salvation by His death upon Calvary's cross. And also in time, God the Spirit applies to the hearts of His own the blessings which Christ has obtained for them by His death. That's the gospel. In obtaining salvation for men, God was active. In salvation, we are delivered from the guilt and pollutions of sin. And we receive wondrous, blessed righteousness of the eternal Christ. Have we once believed and were so fervent in the Lord? And what happened now? Well, we need to examine our hearts. Why was the church in Laodicea lukewarm, neither hot nor cold? It, was a very, it is a very sad state, isn't it? Neither hot nor cold. If you're hot, that's good. But neither hot nor cold. If you're cold, you can see. Right? Neither hot nor cold. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? Well, that's the trouble with the church today. One step in the world, one step, one thing to follow the Lord. Well, we can't do like that. You can't juggle. You're the best juggernaut. You can't juggle properly like that. There is no other way. And we tread on, we tread on, and we tread on. That's not the way. And the Lord wants us to truly come and seek Him, truly come and follow Him, so that when we would do so, there is truly in our hearts uh, the joy of salvation because, well, when we come to Him, uh, He makes all things beautiful and we can trust Him to do so when we would surrender ourselves to Him and allow Him to lead and guide us. May the Lord help us. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Strengthen us and grant to us Thy peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. For Thy own name's sake, hear our prayer. This I ask with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.